Joining us in the KX Country Clubhouse this afternoon, songwriter, producer, and head of Manic Down Productions, his very own production company, Dan Swinimer. Dan, thanks for stopping in today. Pete, thanks for having me, my friend. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. A lot of folks, you know, back in the day uh, when I was growing up, we used to read liner notes and I used to do that. I'd sit and listen to the album and I'd say, oh, so-and-so wrote that. Oh, it was produced by blah, blah. Oh, so-and-so played piano on it. Nowadays, people don't do that so much, but boy, if they did, they'd see your name just about everywhere, Dan Swinimer. Well, it's funny because guys like me love people like you who actually read the liner notes, <laughs> but um, typically I've found too that guys like me tend to enjoy being kind of in the backdrop and uh, watching what the artists go through. Um, you know, I remember watching artists that I'd be on the road with after a show, like doing signings for hours after like just blasting all their energy out on the stage and then meeting people and signing for hours after. Whew. Well, the band, by the way, is backstage, you know, having a few cold ones, having a few laughs and um so anyways but i i do appreciate people that actually take the time to see not just for the writers and the producers but the musicians because i know for me personally i'm nothing without my musicians now you're out in british columbia and that's where manic down productions is based and we first became aware of you uh back in 2014 or so with the release of madeline merlot's debut which you co-wrote singing like a stone maddie was 17 when you met her yes it was a pretty lucky day for me obviously i mean uh, she's such a sweet girl, and she still to this day thanks me for uh, every every milestone that she reaches. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that should be thanking her because as a writer producer, nothing makes you look better than a singer of that caliber. I can assure you. And boy, has she grown as a songwriter too, eh, Dan? You got to have some some hand in that as well. Well. All I did was was provide her with the pool to dip her toe into. Um, I encouraged her to be a songwriter and I, I, I really felt like she would be a good one just based on the conversations that we would have. She, she had such a, she had such a cool perspective on life. She was such an interesting person to be around. Um, the way that she expressed herself, I always found so, so interesting. And I just knew that she would, and she was so good with melodies too. Like it was, it was a natural thing for her. So um, but the most important thing was once I kind of helped her get started, she just um, worked her butt off. Like um, you get that rare thing where it's talent combined with work ethic with Madeline. And because um, what happens oftentimes when you have natural gifts, you never have to work that hard. So you don't develop that work ethic, but somehow she managed to get both uh mix in a whole lot of grace and humility and you've got Madeline. not long after that you hooked up with a fella by the name of jojo mason co-wrote a few of his songs uh produced them and that was quite a story then too yeah um again pretty lucky chance meeting um i had been writing uh on a friday with the aforementioned jeff johnson and jeff and i have uh, you know, we've been doing stuff together forever in, in music. And um, so we're very comfortable when we write and we have very friendly uh, headbutting sessions, which um, you, you, you get excited about that as a writer because you know that when the two are comfortable enough in the room. Anyways, um, we had an argument about a line that I wanted to use sipping moonshine out of a jar, um, which I used to, it wasn't technically moonshine, but as a kid growing up in a small town in Ontario, um, you, dad, earmuffs, please. Um, used to sneak into your dad's liquor cabinet, take a little out of each bottle so he wouldn't Jungle. know any- We called it jungle juice at the time, I believe. So for us, we called it uh, either moonshine or, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember. We had two names for it, but moonshine was one. And often we would, use a pickle jar or a mason jar to to carry it so i said you know sipping moonshine out of a jar which jeff and i were new to country at the time so we didn't know that that was practically a cliche in country music <laughs> but he didn't get it he was like why are you sipping it out of a out of a out of a, a jar and i said well that's what we did and he's like well maybe you did it but nobody else does that no one's gonna know what you're talking about so we have this this friendly back and forth and then no word of a lie. Later that night, I go to a Christmas party uh, at a friend's place and 
this guy shows up and I'm always very aware being in artist development of someone who has that X factor, that big personality. And um, with Madeline, I always used to say when she walks into a room, it's like someone just flicked the lights on. And um, so this guy walks in with a personality bigger than, you know, than uh, the biggest room you can imagine. And uh, he, and he, so he comes walking in, I immediately recognize the personality, but I have no reason to believe that, you know, I haven't connected it to music at all, but he walks into the kitchen, takes off a backpack, pulls out, no word of a lie, moonshine that he bought that came in a mason jar. <laughs> so immediately, that's a talking point for me because of what had happened earlier that day. So we get talking, yeah. we get drinking the moonshine. At first he's like, who is this guy? And eventually, um, you know, he asked what I did for a living and I told him that I was in music and he asked, you know, he knew all the Madeline stuff I had done and was a, he was a huge country music fan. So uh, after many moonshines and a few hours had passed, I just said to him, you know, it's too bad you're not in music because you've got that X factor that I'm always looking for. And he said, you know, I'd uh, why don't you uh, let me try? And I asked him if he had ever sung for anyone. He said no. And I asked him if he was any good. And he said he didn't think he was the worst. And anyways, I don't know. I just had a feeling. So I gave him my card and said, you know, if you still feel that way tomorrow, it's worth an hour of my time. Come on in. He did. A year and a half later, we had our first top 10 hit together. Good kind of love. And what a catchy that one that was. And you co-wrote that one too, did you not? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, the first one was actually It's All Good. Oh, It's All Good. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good Kind of Love came second. Thank you, Dan. Good Kind of Love came second. And that one we ended up writing in Nashville with a good buddy, Phil Barton, which anyone in the country music uh, industry knows very, very well. He's very well known and full of energy. But yeah, we had a, it was a really, really great run. And, and again, consider myself, like, what are the chances of that happening? You know, how lucky am I to, because it, it's not like Jojo came into the stu studio having never sung for anyone and was terrible and I had to teach him how to sing. The guy could sing. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I consider myself ridiculously lucky in both of those cases. Two for two, Madeline Merlot and Jojo Mason. And right. since then, you've gone on to do a bunch of other work, including Peter Burroughs' Elise Saunders, her latest. Did you not work with Sasha as well from Oshawa? I did. I produced uh, her her current single standards and her her current EP. I, I, uh, and I actually, there's a song on her current EP called Runaway that I co-wrote with uh, Tennille Towns. Hmm. So you're still doing the writing in addition to the production. And I know you had a Billy Currington cut. That's really something to get a Nashville artist doing one of your songs. Yeah, yeah, that was um, th that was a nice surprise because um, I was getting at the time I had a publishing deal. I was right. That was my thing. I, I didn't even really want to do production. It's funny because when Madeline, when I got her her deal with Open Road, they said they wanted me to produce her first record. And I was like, I don't want to produce it. Because I was a, the songwriter, I, I was a writer on every song. I wanted like one of these big fancy producers to produce it to protect my songwriting. <laughs> and they, they kept insisting that I produce it. I'm like, please, no, get a really good producer. So um, I'm glad they, they, they convinced me to do it because now it's, it's, you know, the tables have turned. I do more production than writing. The pandemic hasn't slowed you down at all. Manic Down Productions has been in full steam. What are you working on these days? Um, well, I'm really, ex like, really excited. I literally just delivered the next two David James songs uh, to mix uh, on Sunday. So I should get those mixes back. And I'm telling you, these are by far the best David James songs that, uh, that you have ever heard. David's got such a strong voice. And I think people don't realize that. They hear his songs on the radio. But when you see him live, He's like Robert Plant, man. He's just... Have you seen him do those Led Zeppelin covers? Yes. It's insane. And I, I sort of, you know, because the challenge is I see him do that. And I, I had already produced a bunch of this stuff the first time I saw him do that. And I was just like, why aren't we taking advantage of that? That is ridiculous. Nobody can do that. And I feel like I might have found a way to... It's not full on Robert Plant, but I feel like I found a way to... Uh, and I even warned Mike Denny, the, the president of, uh, of MDM Recordings, David's label, before I sent him my rough of the song, I said, okay, 
I got to warn you in advance. You know, I've wanted to get some of this, some element of this Robert Plant thing in one of David's songs. I kind of think I did. And I think I did it in a way that isn't going to kill its chances at radio, but I do require you to have an open mind. When you <laughs> and Mike is so great. He did have an open mind. He loved it. It's, I think I finally found a tasteful way to show a little bit more of what David can do. And, um, but if you ever get a chance to see David live and see him actually cover a Led Zeppelin song, it is something to see for sure. Have you got any advice you'd offer up and comers? Like a lot of folks want to be singers, they want to be stars, but I know there's people out there that are writing songs and have no desire to get on stage or they're twiddling knobs in their basement at their recording studio. Do you have any advice for, for potential future producer and writers? Well, I'll tell you one thing, don't do what you've done, which is write all these amazing clips and then not show anyone. I didn't know that you did anything to any of this stuff. And it, so I go through, you send me some, I finally find out. Oh, you're I, talking I, about, you're yeah, talking about my music? Yes. <laughs> you send me the, your SoundCloud and I'm going through listening and it's like, you've got every style of music. I, I had so much fun <laughs> checking out your stuff, and, but I couldn't believe the eclectic, the wildly eclectic styles that you're writing in. I have, I have very eclectic tastes. I've loved all kinds of music since I was growing up, country music especially. And if anything, I wish I could write better country songs. I, I listen to the stuff you guys do and I'm like, maybe I just got to find the right collaborator, Dan. Well, it's partly that and it's partly, it's, it's hard to have a real job um, at the level that you have. And also because, you know, the, the, the true advice is just um, working at it because there is no substitute for it. And uh, one of the most tragic things that I see in country music, in music in general, is is people that have a gift and they don't know how to use it because the talented ones rise to the top without the work ethic. But you can only get so far. Eventually, you eventually you're you're competing with everyone that has a similar level of talent, and you're still not all the way there. And then it's your work ethic that will that will truly put you over the top. Um, and just just doing it, um, literally everything that I've done in music has been out of sheer necessity. Um, when I first got my writing deal in Nashville, nobody was recording my songs. Uh, I felt like I was writing songs that could do well at radio, or uh, and but it's, I still wasn't getting any cuts. So I went out and found my own artist, and that was Madeline. Uh, and I and I worked with her for two years behind the scenes because she was very young. Um, she was a great singer, but there was other stuff that, that needed work and she was totally gung ho and, um, and, and again, even production, like I, I didn't want to be a producer, but I didn't have the money to hire a producer to record demos. I had to figure it out. Um, and it's not that I suggest wearing all these different hats, but you, it's, it's literally just a matter of, if you really want it, you got to spend all your time at it because there's someone, uh, out there there's always someone out there that is putting everything they've got into it. Dan, I know you've been developing this new app that's uh, bringing artists together. It's called Tribe, T-R-Y-B-E. Can you tell us about it? Simply explain what it is and, and where people can find out about it. Absolutely. So um, my good friend Felipe called me one day and uh, had an issue with the fact that his son, who was a semi-professional scooter rider, you know, scooters, little thin uh, skateboard with a handle on it. He does things that would blow your mind on this thing. Um, he spent all his time practicing and he was getting so good. And then he spends all his money on video editing equipment and recording himself and posting it and getting likes and that's it. And Felipe tells me this and I say, you know, I feel the same way about artists that I work with. They spend so much time posting content on social media. Why, why shouldn't they be compensated for that, especially when you hear that Facebook, 1% of Facebook is worth $5 billion. Um, so we set out to try and solve this problem. And we hope that we have with our new social platform called Tribe. Um, the, the concept is the core concept is very simple. Uh, we've created a system where you can like in the same way that you would like on Instagram, but you can also award. And if you award, you're actually sending uh, an amount of money. It can be as little as 10 cents or as much as you want. Um, we kind of realized that that might not be enough incentive, just the goodwill 
to get people to awards. So we wanted to incentivize it a little bit more. So we decided that um, based on Instagram success and Facebook success, people really value exposure and engagement on their post. So we felt like, um, what if we, in exchange for awarding someone's post, a good deed, you get something in return in the form of exposure for your own posts. And um, immediately I felt like I understood the power of that for an artist who's, um, you know, they spend so much time and energy on social media, they get nothing in return. On our platform, you can go out and do a few good deeds and you can stockpile this, um, this uh, ability to, to boost your own post. And then when you have your new song or, or your content that you're excited about, uh, you can you know, give a couple of people 10 cent awards and then you can boost your own post and really push that out. And the more you boost your post, the more awards you're gonna receive for your post. Um, and if you follow that down the rabbit hole when the, the, the platform scales and we have a lot of people in there and then the corporations inevitably come in and start spending their huge social media budget uh, on our platform, um, they have the same set of rules that all the users, the individual users have. They have to pay the users in order to boost their content. And they're spending millions and millions of dollars uh, boosting content on social media currently. So now all that money is out into the tribe community. There's a lot of money there to go around. We, we felt there's still a business there for us if we give the users most of the boosting money and not keep it for ourselves. So um, we're really excited about um, what we can, you know, maybe changing the landscape of social media. It sounds revolutionary and it sounds like a lot of work and you're going to need to build the critical mass. But boy, once it gets going, how do people find out more about the tribe? It's a platform, I guess, not an app as such. Yeah, it's um, it is an app. And in fact, um, currently, it's much more a mobile app than it is. The website is up, but um, and the website will be much more, uh, uh, much more functional as we go. But um, in the tech world, you kind of just have to, you know, to make you know, the biggest thing you're worried about is running out of money. So uh, we're always, um, you know, prioritizing and the app, getting the app ready was the first thing. Uh, so the app is ready. You can go to your, and we ungated it just literally like a couple of weeks ago. So you can go to the app store, whichever kind of phone you have and download it from the app store. Um, and it's worth sticking with us because it's early. The app is um it's the features you know the features are coming gradually as we go the core feature is there you can award and you can boost your post and and but as the app gets bigger and uh as the features grow and even the design like you know we have a very basic design at this point but the design will be uh evolving a lot over the next uh, few months and um it like you don't have to be a musician anyone you're everyone's already posting if you post and tribe and your post gets a lot of engagement, then you're going to get some of that money uh, to keep. And whether you make $30 a year or $300,000 a year or anything in between, why not? You know, it's still something. And um, uh, we really believe in uh, making social media a more social and more fair experience for people. Couldn't agree more. And again, it's spelled T-R-Y-B-E. One other thing I'd like to mention about the app, um, we've opened our first program. Uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of these programs. It's called the One to Watch program. And the first one is One to Watch Music. And all you have to do is post on Tribe and something musical, like whether it's a, an original song, you can be you performing a cover, just something musical. Use the hashtag One to Watch Music. And every month, we the the post that gets the most engagement wins the equivalent of two hundred dollars, and a name that we um, that we mentioned earlier, Elise Saunders. She actually won the very first inaugural One to Watch Music uh, program with. Uh, she did a beautiful, beautiful cover of "Stand by Me." So two hundred dollars, it's there for the taking. Um, every month it's going to get harder to win because the, the, the platform's growing and there's going to be more people involved. So uh, get in and get on and, um, and try and take advantage as much as you can uh, of a new revenue source for artists. 
tribe with a Y, seek it out, artists, songwriters, uh, I guess, painters, whatever. Eh? Any you got to get in on this, Pete. You are a songwriter. <laughs> and I, I really, I really am going to start bugging you to get your music out there a little bit more. All right, brother. I appreciate that. We've been chatting with Dan Swinimer inside the KX Country Clubhouse. Dan, thank you so much. Take care. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.